Emily Nagoski, author of the revolutionary best-selling non-fiction book on sexual wellness, Come As You Are, has released a new book. So to celebrate, I'm going to tell you guys the five best non-fiction books to read if, like me, you're interested in learning about love and sexuality and relationships. Hi, I'm Cameron. This is Slaggy Book Club. If you're a subscriber, hello, I love you. If you're new here, welcome. We talk about literary fiction, we talk about non-fiction, and we talk about just a bit of whatever else I want. So hit that subscribe button, hit the bell, join the book club. I am so happy to have you. In this video, I'm going to share with you five of my favourite non-fiction books on love, sexuality and relationships. My favourite subgenre of non-fic to read about, I think. And before we jump in, I would love to know what your favourite subgenre of non-fiction is. Do you like biographies and memoirs? Are you more of a psychology reader? And if you like reading about sexuality and dating and romance and love and all of these things as well please tell me what your favorite books on the subject are because i am always looking for more recommendations as a teenager i was an obsessive romantic and i was fascinated by sex Longtime followers of Sluggy book club might be surprised to learn that my favorite genre of film was and kind of still is romance although they do not make them like they used to. I just love a love story. I was also fairly convinced that I was going to end up dating a celebrity, most likely Justin Bieber, um, but I would have accepted Niall Horan or Dylan O'Brien or like any number of more accessible local soap stars. And just in case I didn't end up dating a celebrity, I romanticized every single interaction that I had with the boys at my school to and honestly beyond the point of humiliation. I mean, I was so deeply in the trenches of the hellhole website that is tumblr.com. Can you blame me? As an adult, I have tried to refine these tendencies and I think for the most part I have succeeded. I mean, I now record my innermost thoughts in an actually private journal rather than a public website. I've developed somewhat of an aversion to media of the romantic genre, although again part of me does think that that's something to do with a reduction in quality and form rather than anything internal. A conversation for another time. There is still a part of me that believes that I could probably definitely date a celebrity. Don't tell my boyfriend. But you know the obsessive nature has waned kind of don't worry about the fact that i cried when i found out tom holland was dating zendaya that's normal right and i still am curious about sex but in a healthy you know wanting to be informed kind of way rather than a connecting to my neighbor's wi-fi at 12 30 a.m on my ipod touch on a school night to scroll through 56 pages of porn way all this is to say that I am still deeply interested in intellectualizing love, sexuality and relationships. I don't know why these things fascinate me so much. I'm sure a therapist would love to get to the bottom of that if I could only afford one. But that means that when I am looking for nonfiction to read, those are the sections of the bookstore that I go to. Which is why I was so excited to find out that Emily Nagoski has released a follow-up book to her bestseller Come As You Are. It is called Come Together, The Science and Art of Creating Lasting Sexual Connections. Now while this first one, Come As You Are, centers the self and is aimed at helping individuals understand their own desires. Come Together shifts its focus to sexual wellness within long-term relationships. Now in Come Together, Emily does draw on the same concepts for understanding sexuality that she introduces in Come As You Are. So it is definitely in a sense a sequel, like read Come As You Are first. It is essential reading really for everybody. It, it's fantastic and it lays down the foundations of knowledge to then pick up this one. And now, transparently, I haven't finished this yet. I'm about halfway through, but it lays down some really useful practices for 
understanding your partner's sexual wants and needs, how to communicate about those things empathetically and openly, and just like quite simply how to keep the spark alive. Now again, I am not personally in a long-term relationship, so there is like quite a bit in this book that doesn't necessarily apply to me, but I'm still finding it super fascinating. Again, I'm just interested in reading about this stuff and I'm almost taking it as like future knowledge or like feeding my future self so that when and if any of the stuff in here comes up, I'm going to be like, oh wait, I know about this. I learned about this. I know how to handle this situation. Let's go back and refer to this amazing resource. Um, and I really think that one of the huge strengths of Emily's work is her really diverse case studies. I feel like she makes such a conscious effort to demonstrate how her, her concepts and her practices can be utilized by all kinds of people in all kinds of relationships. And I really respect that. In Come Together, Emily focuses not on how to want sex more, nor does she focus on, you know, how often should we be having sex in long-term relationships? What she really stresses is that the important thing is how much you're enjoying the sex that you're having. Thank you so much to Penguin for gifting me this copy of Come Together by Emily Nagoski. So the five books on love, sexuality and relationships that I love and think everybody should read are Conversations on Love by Natasha Lunn. Now if you're predominantly a fiction reader but you are kind of tempted to dip your toe into the nonfiction world or you like to dabble in nonfiction from time to time without diving headfirst into, you know, a deeply intellectual thesis, this 256 page therapy session is the book for you. This is a deeply moving, deeply personal collection of conversations in which Natasha speaks with a bunch of writers and experts like Lisa Tadeo, Esther Perel, Dolly Alderton, Roxane Gay, Emily Nagoski about their philosophies and experiences when it comes to matters of the heart. The conversations in this book are truly so personal, profound and comforting. I wouldn't shut up about this book after I finished it. I read this when I was cat sitting in England. I found it on the bookshelf at the house that I was staying at and I smashed it. I finished that book in an afternoon. Like, oh my God, it blew my mind. I hadn't felt that way about a book in such a long time, maybe since I'd read Three Women by Lisa Tadeo and it just like left me so speechless and like in awe. This book is insane but because I read it at this house sit in England I don't have it, I don't own it and I have been on the lookout for a secondhand copy like every time I'm in an op shop, every time I'm in a secondhand bookstore I'm like do they have conversations on love because I need to own this book. This book is like a bible, it's one of those books that I just want to go back and read all the time. I cannot recommend this enough. The next book is Poly Secure, Attachment, Trauma and Consensual Non-Monogamy by Jessica Byrne. Now I got this book a few years ago at the height of the ethical non-monogamy epidemic. Now I, I'd had my curiosities about human monogamy but I'd never really given that much thought to any alternatives. Then the dating apps more specifically the hellscape that is Hinge, became plagued with people in or seeking ethical non-monog situations and Polysecure fell into my lap. Now let me sidestep for a second and say that I am now in a very happy, very monogamous relationship and so my curiosities about polyamory as it pertains to my own life have somewhat dimmed. This book though does still contain a bunch of fascinating and valuable information. So in terms of polyamory and other forms of non-monogamy, this book is really info heavy. But I kind of remember it reading as more of like a guide than an objective source of information. 
And as someone who wasn't practicing polyamory, it was a lot of stuff that just didn't really apply to me, which of course, to a degree, was super interesting to read about. But it did also at times feel like I was kind of learning the rules to a game I wasn't gonna play. What I found even more interesting in this book though were the sections about attachment styles. It is called poly secure after all, right? It's not just about polyamory. There is some really fascinating deep insight into attachment styles and where they come from and how they're formed and how they change from childhood to adulthood etc etc. So much amazing information. It goes so far beyond like you know yeah girl you're anxious avoidant. <laughs> I learned so much about myself, about understanding other people and I find myself regularly or maybe not regularly but like on multiple occasions I have gone back to this book to the parts on attachment theory and brushed up on it because sometimes things come up in your life and you're like mm, I think I see what I'm doing here and then you read it and you're like yeah fuck so yes, this is a book about how attachment theory pertains to non-monogamy. So it's maybe not the best one to pick up if you're like purely interested in reading about attachment theory, but if there is a part of you, and I don't know how dominant that part might be, <laughs> that is a bit interested in non-monogamy, this is such a valuable resource. Okay, this next one is not entry-level non-fiction. I felt simultaneously so smart and so dumb while I was reading this book. It is The Right to Sex by Amiya Srinivasan. Oh boy, this book is dense. Which is another way of saying that it is well-researched and deeply informative and very thought-provoking. But it's one of those books that I am gonna have to go back and read again, not because I loved it so much, but well, I did, I am here recommending it, but because my soft little brain could only absorb so much. In this book, Amiya dissects the politics of sex, how we think and speak about it and what it really means in the 21st century. I love this blurb from Gia Tolentino where she sums up this book so much better than I ever could. She says, Amir Srinivasan is an unparalleled and extraordinary writer. No one x-rays an argument, a desire, a contradiction, a defense mechanism quite like her. In stripping the new politics of sex and desire down to its fundamental and sometimes clashing principles, the right to sex is a bracing revivification of a crucial lineage in feminist writing. Srinivasan is daring, compassionate, and in relentless search of a new frame. Whew! Gia and her words. Amazing woman. This really is one of those books that feel like essential reading, like you become a better and smarter person by absorbing its wisdom. Amir Srinivasan is an incredibly talented author. It, this is her debut. It's insane. Like, so well researched, so well written, and now I really want to go and read it again, like right now. I don't even have it on me. Who has it? I think my friend has it. Now, I would be remiss not to include Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski in this video, and it genuinely is one of my favorite books on sex that I have ever read. It is full of new easy to understand information that takes an empathetic, nuanced and inclusive approach to understanding one's own sexual well-being. It centers pleasure and it breaks down the form and function of desire in a revolutionary way. Now, fun fact, this was actually published almost 10 years ago in 2015, but it exploded in popularity upon its revised and updated re-release in 2021. It even copped a mention in the incredible, like, don't get me started. I love this show, Sex Education. Maeve Wiley recommended that Amy read it. 
I love that show. This book truly is an incredible, incredible resource for all women. All women must read it. Maeve, Wiley, you are correct. And finally, an uncomfortable read, but a very, very important one. Consent Laid Bare by Australian consent activist Chanel Contos is a revelatory guide to consent and essentially an expose on the depth of rape culture within schools as well as within politics and media. In this book, Chanel makes a really compelling case for mandating consent education in all schools. She draws largely upon her own experience within the private school system um, and she argues that the majority of these sexual assaults that are happening in schools, like teenagers, right, are happening due to a lack of adequate sex and consent education. It's very easy for people to sit back and say that people should know better, but how can you say that when teenagers are not being taught how to navigate responsibly conversations about sex and consent. They're not being taught how to deal with these things. So how should they know better? The numbers in this book are shocking. The anecdotes are honestly like devastatingly relatable. Chanel is calling for radical change in this book, but the stats show that what we've been doing isn't working so I mean I honestly wish I had this book this information when I was a teenager I can only imagine how much more empowering adolescence could be if like if this book was prescribed reading for all genders in schools I feel like teenagers would be having a better time now when I first posted about this book. I made a comment about the fact that I was disappointed to see that the cover was pink and there are some people who were not happy with me saying that. I think people thought I was being sexist or something but I stand by that sentiment because while we have come a long way in terms of you know concepts of gender and stuff, a pink book is still being marketed as a book for women. That's just fact, right? And yes, I'm sure there are plenty of teenage boys who will happily pick up this pink book and read it, but I think that a lot more would read it if it had a bit more of a neutral design. It's a disappointing marketing decision by the publisher for a book that is intended to be read by all genders. But please let me know your thoughts. Is a book with a pink cover being marketed towards women or is this a neutral cover that would catch the eye of a teenage boy as well? Let me know what you think. So there you go, five non-fiction books on love, sexuality and relationships that if you're still here watching this, listening to me right now, you should definitely read. <laughs> um, and I would love to hear your favorite nonfiction books. So make sure you drop a comment below and let me know your faves. Thank you so much for watching this video. It means so much to me. And I will see you in the next one. Love ya.